Pulitzer Prizes for his previous books. He's joined in this discussion by Steven Pinker, a psychologist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the author of a book called How the Mind Works. Good evening. Welcome to Barnes & Noble Union Square. I would like to thank you all for joining us on this special occasion for a dialogue between two of the foremost scientists of our time, Professor E. O. Wilson and Steven Pinker. Professor Wilson is currently Pellegrino University Professor Emeritus and Curator in Entomology of the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. He has twice won the Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction for On Human Nature and the Ants. His new book is Consilience, The Uniting of Culture. Steven Pinker, one of the world's leading cognitive scientists, is professor of psychology and the director of, of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at, at the Massachusetts Insti Institute of Technology. He is the author of How the Mind Works. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Professor E.O. Wilson and Steven Pinker. Thank you very much. I've been asked to uh, lead off tonight, and I do so with pleasure while uh, uh, expressing added pleasure that I can uh, appear here tonight with my uh, colleague, uh, Steve uh, Pinker, who's uh, we've just gotten getting to know each other. We haven't worked together or spoken together before. Uh, I, my uh, job is to present uh, essentially the uh, elements of the argument of consilience and uh, I will mention in passing in the 10 minutes or so that I attempt this uh, to make reference to uh, uh, Pinker's own area of research, cognitive uh, uh, neuroscience. Uh, the word consilience is, I didn't just get it out of the air. Uh, it's been around for 160 years. It was introduced in 1840 by William Hewell, who uh, is generally uh, regarded as the uh, founder of the philosophy of science, and he meant it to be, uh, in a very strictly defined sense, the interlocking of cause and effect explanation across different disciplines, uh, the strength of which he said would uh, determine the validity of the theoretical explanations in those respective disciplines. The word has been used uh, sparingly by uh, philosophers of science ever since, and I mean to drag it out into the mainstream where it will be very likely corrupted by multiple usage and co-opted and so on if uh, the, uh, this effort is successful. It means essentially the same thing as coherence or interconnectedness or the convergence theory of truth, but whereas particularly those first two words uh, have acquired uh, many meanings through heavy use, this is not the case for consilience. Consilience, then, is the mother's milk of the natural sciences. And I think you can get a sense of what is going on when I say that in the 19th century, uh, physics and chemistry became consilient. That is to say, uh, chemistry was demonstrated pretty, th uh, was demonstrated thoroughly uh, to, obedient, uh, to be obedient to the laws of physics. And in the 20th century, the great triumph of molecular biology extended that web work of cause and effect explanation on up into the macromolecules that uh, determine information and catalyze the organic uh, uh, reactions that drive life. And now what's important is that through the relentless expansion of the natural sciences, uh, doubling in numbers of published discoveries and uh, workers and journals uh, every 15 years or so, at least up to about the 1970s, uh, has uh, moved inexorably uh, into uh, the borderland areas, as I like to call them, between the natural sciences and the social sciences plus the humanities. Now, uh, by the uh, natural sciences are pretty fully consilient all the way from quantum physics through reagent chemistry to macro uh, molecular uh, biology, to um, cell biology, organismic biology, and on up to, as we will address tonight jointly, the brain itself, the working of the brain, 
and uh, mine. With the prospect, and this is what makes conciliance uh, still speculative, yet promising and exciting to a large, to an increasing number of scholars on both sides of that line, uh, the prospects of conciliance extending on at last uh, to the social sciences and the humanities. That, of course, was the dream, one of the dreams of the Enlightenment uh, thinkers of the 17th and the 18th centuries, that all of human knowledge could be unified and that this unification would serve to the progress of uh, the human species. It failed to deliver on its promise from the natural sciences, however, and that was just one of the reasons why the original Enlightenment died toward the end of the 18th century. Now the renewal, and this would be my, my main argument, a part of my main historical part of my argument, the time has arrived at last to consider the renewal of the Enlightenment and a, a unification agenda. Uh, the central part of the uh, argument uh, then devolves to that line which for centuries has been drawn between the two cultures, roughly defined as the two cultures, the natural sciences on one side, the social sciences, particularly the humanistic aspects of the social sciences, and the humanities on the other side. We are now, I think, discovering by efforts coming from both sides of that line that it is not an epistemological discontinuity with different truths and ways of thinking fundamentally different on both sides. It is not that line, a Hadrian wall, uh, built to keep the reductionist barbarians from the sciences away from high culture. But it is, in fact, uh, as it disappears, being revealed to uh, uh, consist of a domain, a very broad domain, of little understood and mostly unexplored phenomena. And that brings me then to the borderland disciplines arising from the natural sciences, which is uh, Steve Pinker and my common interest. Uh, these borderland disciplines, which are beginning to bridge uh, over uh, particularly to the social sciences at long last, are four in number. I believe they can be counted that way. First of all, cognitive neuroscience, uh, the, uh, also known as the brain sciences, uh, which is imaging with uh, rapidly improving resolution in time and space the activities of the brain. And uh, these are becoming, these activities are more and more um, uh, complex. Uh, so the searching ability of these techniques uh, is improving swiftly. A second borderland discipline is behavioral genetics, human behavioral genetics, which through combinations of very sophisticated analysis of uh, the uh, genetic relationships uh, correlated with cognitive and other ca characteristics of mental activity in human beings and uh, the uh, rapid advance of human genetics overall to the molecular level, to the level of the gene and the genetic code, is beginning to provide a solid foundation on which to build a biological understanding of the programming of the anatomy of the brain and ultimately of its algorithms and biological, thus, thus biological activities. A third uh, borderland discipline is evolutionary biology. Uh, the tracing, the attempts to trace uh, the history of the human species and now and especially uh, the, um, uh, the origins of the mind in terms of the survival and reproductive value it gives, the Darwinian fitness. Uh, this was uh, a subject that I got into uh, 20 years ago with sociobiology. Uh, in the early stages of this investigation. Sociobiology is now also known as evolutionary psychology and has lost a lot of its sting. It's now much more seen much more uh, as a reasonable uh, as a, uh, discipline in its own right, uh, well cultivated now by um, a, large, a new generation of very bright scholars. And finally, environmental sciences are as the uh, borderland discipline that uh, describes uh, in, with increasing uh, definitive detail the arena in which the human species as a biological species evolved and to which we are exquisitely well adapted. So environmentalism is a uh, way of thinking and as well as a discipline that uh, benefits from the naturalistic approach, the materialist approach uh, foretold uh, by the
uh, extension of the natural sciences into that broader, area, broader land area, and uh, not to neglect uh, the contributions of social sciences, similar uh, hostoria, the development, you know, extensions are occurring from the social sciences uh, through fields like cognitive psychology and, um, and uh, biological anthropology, and they are beginning to meet and interconnect conciliably uh, with the natural sciences. The key to understanding uh, what is happening and why it is important is, in my judgment, uh, that this approach is uh, allowing us at long last to uh, provide a precise and operational definition of human nature, and I will offer it now. Human nature is not the genes that prescribe human nature. Human nature is not the cultural universals like the, like the incest taboo and the rites of passage found all through the human species, which are the products of human nature. Human nature is the epigenetic rules, the hereditary regularities in development, and particularly mental development, uh, that uh, lead uh, to the consistencies of large uh, sectors of human behavior and biases in the uh, evolution, uh, the cultural evolution, that um, uh, has uh, become uh, well defined, I think, within ethnography and many psychological studies. So once we have defined that and we've able to make the linkages across the borderland areas from genes to organismic biology, to the brain, to the working of the brain, the algorithms, the regularities in mental development uh, that characterize the human species, and then approach that broad, unknown, largely still unexplored area between the development of the individual human mind and then in aggregate of culture itself leading to cultural evolution, uh, then we will have begun to make a completely consilient connection. Uh, this I regard, the latter I regard as the key problem of the social sciences, the interaction of genetic evolution with cultural evolution. That's nature and nurture at that level, just as I think any biologist outside of perhaps the narrowest uh, purviews of molecular biology would agree that the master problem of the natural sciences is now the solution of the brain. Uh, what it is uh, of, of action and what is the mind and what is uh, human consciousness. So I'm going to uh, stop at this point, but I'm uh, by uh, saying that um, the uh, it would be uh, very uh, useful for me, as I have done in the book Consilient, to, uh, but I, I don't have time to spell it out, maybe this will emerge in our conversation, uh, to uh, uh, describe some of these epigenetic rules and show why uh, they are so important. Among them certainly are uh, the, um, uh, the algorithms of, uh, of, of language, the language instinct, to use uh, Steve uh, Pinker's uh, expression, on uh, which uh, we have uh, gained so much more knowledge. Others have to do with virtually, uh, well, the major categories of human behavior are beginning to be illuminated, I think, by the definition of epigenetic rules and therefore the relation between genes and development of the mind. This is where the action is. I also like to suggest that uh, not only is this where much of the action of scholarship will be in the future, both social science and humanistic scholarship with the natural sciences, but also this is where by shifting the frame of discourse to the intermediate areas and to the entire question of consilience. Does it exist? Does it not? Is it universal? What will it look like uh, that we can uh, bring about a, a revitalization of the liberal arts? If you want to have a, 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 a um, discourse between the natural scientists and the social sciences and the scholars and the humanities and the teachers of these subjects, at least in higher education, this is where to have it. Have it. Whether you are uh, promoting the consilience program and are actively exploring it as a scholar or a scientist, or whether you reject it philosophically or viscerally. This is what we, in discussing the issues thoroughly, uh, can uh, hope to revitalize the liberal arts, which are in terrible condition in our...
colleges and universities, incidentally. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, invite um, Steve to just lead off and, and make a speech or you know, ask a question, uh, refute, uh, destroy, humiliate, anything he wants to do. Uh, but um, maybe we'd better stay seated for this, rather than just hopping back and forth on the table. Steve. Well, I think we're all seeing a nice example of consilience here tonight uh, the, by the fact that uh, Professor Ed Wilson and I are um, sharing ideas on these topics. In uh, Ed Wilson's, uh, I'm sorry, okay. In, <coughs> Maybe shove yeah. a little forward. In, uh, I think you're seeing a nice example of consilience tonight in the fact that uh, Professor Ed Wilson and I are, are having this dialogue. In uh, his day job, Professor Wilson studies ants, which is a subject that only a scientist could love. And um, I study language, which is the quintessential cultural trait. It's the way in which we transmit a great deal of our cultural information, and it's often held up as mankind's proudest cultural achievement. On the other hand, I think that they're, um, they're really closely connected. I think it's just a uh, matter of convenience that we're in different kinds of departments, but that there really are two different aspects of the same subject matter. I happen to study one particular organ of one particular species. For me, the species isn't ants, it's uh, homo sapiens. And rather than studying chemical communication, I study the kind of communication that we do by modifying the noise that we make when we exhale. But um, I do think that the two um, approaches are really just different ends of one large fabric of knowledge. And uh, that idea is what uh, Ed Wilson calls consilience. It's an idea with which I'm uh, deeply sympathetic. So uh, let me start off with a question. This sounds so wonderful and so, um, in this, to me, obvious that all of knowledge is connected, that there's a set of laws that works at different levels of analysis, that ultimately even the products of culture are the products of uh, human nature, which in turn are products of a brain, which is a biological organ, which evolved with the uh, rest of the animal kingdom. But um, why, uh, why did you need to write a book? Uh, why do people seem to hate this idea so much? I'm not denying that they do. I'm not denying that you needed to write the book. But why, what is the opposing point of view that would say that there are discontinuities in uh, knowledge? Uh, certainly there is opposition to the basic idea, uh, not in the way of modeling uh, cause and effect explanations. I think that uh, if uh, you accept a naturalistic or materialistic view of how the whole world works, then uh, including even uh, an empiricist view of the origin of moral reasoning and religious feeling, and I've included that, uh, then uh, it's very difficult to think of a specific model of cause and effect or relationship among the bodies of knowledge that are covered by the, the great branches of learning. On the, uh, the opposition to the basic approach is uh, twofold. Uh, one is uh, methodological, namely uh, the belief that uh, the brain is just too complex an organ. The mind is too, uh, too evanescent, too flickering, too intangible, inaccessible uh, a phenomenon, even if you accepted its material, to ever uh, put a handle on and treat in the manner of the natural sciences. To the answer to this, all I can say is, uh, once again, referring to the progress of the natural sciences to where we are uh, this evening, uh, that exactly that same argument was offered at the turn of the century about uh, vitalism, the nature of life. Life, it was said, would never be explained at the molecular level, uh, uh, just too complicated and so on. And then, of course, uh, when we came to the subject of heredity, it was said, oh, well, the genetic code has got to be a protein. I remember that in around 19, uh, the early 50s, before uh, DNA structure was elucidated. Uh, the genetic code, it's, it's got to be so complex that we will never break it, or it will take a century or two before we begin to break it. And so uh, that uh, none of that has proved to be the case. 
Uh, therefore, I believe optimism in pressing forward uh, into this uh, unknown domain that uh, we are speaking of here between the biological sciences and the, and, uh, the uh, cognition and uh, thence the uh, social sciences, uh, optimism uh, is justified. Now, the other reason is uh, opposition, I think, is uh, philosophical and visceral. It is that there must be something about the human condition that is uh, forever removed uh, from such uh, inquiry. Uh, that, uh, but I've uh, felt that that is uh, not a very uh, easily defended uh, position. Uh, that uh, it's certainly not a reason for discouraging the, uh, the exploration that goes forward. Apart with this, uh, a, a part of this, and I don't want to be too long-winded, you're, you're, you have permission when I finish to be long-winded yourself. <laughs> See, these are subjects that one can go on a great length about, uh, is uh, the fear of reductionism. Uh, reductionism. What are these natural scientists up to? Good Lord, if we keep funding them through the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, they're going to reduce everything to molecules and processes, at least in the way we account for them. Uh, maybe we'd better stop the whole thing right here. Well, uh, this is a gross misunderstanding, a result of gross misunderstanding of reductionism. Uh, scientists are not conquistadors out to melt the Inca gold. Uh, reductionism is part of the scientific process that has produced, uh, proved so successful. All uh, of creative scientists start with a complex process in mind, a cell, an organism, a brain, and they progress. This has been the triumph of the Western methodology. Uh, they progress by finding ways to cleave that system into elements and then fundamental processes, but that's just the first step. The ultimate triumph for the scientific method is the resynthesis of those elements and processes, either with mathematical models initially or literal pre, uh, resynthesis, uh, such that we first reduce the complex process, having understood it as well as we could, reduce it, and now resynthesize it, understanding it vastly better than we did at the beginning. Reduction goes far more quickly than does synthesis. And that has been the story of the science. So predictive synthesis is extremely difficult, but it has progressed through physics, chemistry, and all the way up, in my the way I see it, uh, to the three-dimensional structure of the protein molecule. And that's about where they're stalled right now. They try to work their way around. They need higher, the, uh, the biochemists need higher computational capacity, and, and they, uh, they need um, uh, more precise uh, measurements of, uh, of molecular interaction within the, uh, the molecule. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, you get the impression when you read about how science is working these days uh, that uh, it's all reduction, but it is not. It's both processes. Yes. Um, well, I'm uh, deeply sympathetic to that way of looking at it. And in fact, in my own, uh, my own thinking, the um, two other uh, aspects of living things that were thought to be um, uh, intractable by the methods of the natural sciences, I think, have, uh, have submitted to that analysis in the last couple of decades. One of them being the world of meaning and ideas and reasons and goals, which obviously play a crucial role in explaining human behavior. And it, it was often said that humans are fundamentally different from anything else in the natural world because uh, physical events have causes, one billiard ball clacks into another, whereas human behavior is determined by reasons. Uh, that when John got on the bus, it wasn't because a puff of air blew him onto the bus or you know, a magnet pulled him on, but because he wanted to get onto the bus, because he knew that the bus would take him to his grandmother and he wanted to visit his grandmother, and that that could never be explained in materialist terms. Well, for the last 30 or 40 years, I think we've uh, seen that notions such as beliefs and desires can be understood in physical terms using the uh, concepts from computation and information processing and cybernetics. We have artificially intelligent systems that in a very real sense have knowledge and beliefs and goals and that that's a 
fruitful way of understanding the function of the brain, how it is that this particular organ in our skull, unlike the other organs, can give rise to the phenomena of meaning and reasons and ideas that are so essential in explaining behavior. The other idea, I think, is, uh, is evolution, in particular the mechanism of natural selection, which uh, accounts for another seeming puzzle in the natural world, uh, the existence of design. The fact that uh, organs of the body, including the brain, like uh, man-made contrivances such as watches and ships and wagons, seem to have so many parts arranged so uncannily to do something interesting that you can't conceive of it coming into existence without a designer, namely God. And I think Darwin's uh, lasting contribution is to show how signs of good engineering in the natural world, uh, eyes that have lenses and irises that open and close in response to the light, joints that are lubricated and that swing freely, and so on, can be explained in perfectly material terms by the process of natural selection. So for me, those are the, the idea of computation and evolution are the bridges that are going to tie human nature and ultimately culture to the rest of uh, biology. I think so, sewing up the, uh, this seamless fabric that we're all um, seeking. The, um, but let me turn it into a question. Do you think that there's still um, a great deal of dualistic belief, even among people who would not consider themselves religious in any dogmatic sense? To give an example, the, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Francis Crick wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis. The Astonishing Hypothesis being that the mind is the activity of the brain. And he got some grief from brain scientists about this. Y you call that astonishing? Well, that's just obviously true. We assume that before we walk into the door of the lab. But at least what I've learned is reading some of the reviews of my own book, is that it still is an astonishing hypothesis that the ghost in the machine hovering over our brains, so pulling the levers and reading the little gauges, uh, is still an active idea, uh, among, even among people who aren't religious, and is tied into the whole idea that, um, of where morality and human dignity come from. We don't consider it a sin to dismantle a machine. We do consider it a sin to harm a human being. Therefore, human beings cannot be machines, and therefore the reductionist scheme must fail. We don't hold uh, objects responsible when they are uh, caused to do things. We do hold humans responsible when they act. Therefore, human actions can't be caused in the ordinary physical sense to preserve the idea of responsibility and uh, morality, therefore, we need this notion of some part of the human that is not just uh, physiological activity of the brain, or meat puppets, as uh, one uh, reviewer of my book put it. Uh, <laughs> well, how do you, and how do you respond yeah, well, uh, yes, to that they, kind of criticism? Descartes has died hard, so <laughs> that this life is hard for a cognitive neuroscientist like yourself. And, who has colleagues uh, who will declare that uh, uh, you're just stating the obvious, obvious to them. Uh, and the others uh, just state, uh, many others state that uh, what you're, uh, uh, you're, you're suggesting is so ridiculous that uh, it's not worth even responding to. Uh, I, I believe that uh, one of the uh, most promising developments in cognitive neuroscience has been a, uh, a, a suite of, uh, of models, explicit uh, neurobiological models, maybe not down to the uh, fine details of the circuitry, but nonetheless descriptions of what the conscious mind might be, what subjective consciousness may be, uh, in terms of uh, the mapping process, that is, the uh, mind itself as a map of the external world processed uh, at uh, an almost unbelievably uh, dense and sophisticated manner by that uh, meat computer, uh, but uh, at such a level that uh, it is still extremely difficult for us to, to get at it even reductionistically. Nonetheless, uh, we have now uh, received enough insights from uh, computational models in AI and from neurobiological models that are based on real 
uh, discoveries of uh, circuitry of, of the brain, of the relation to the endocrine system, you know, hormone mediation of responses, neurotransmitter uh, mediation of mood, and so on, uh, and uh, some and a, and a clear definition, as you say, of intention, uh, so that uh, it is possible to uh, put together uh, a reasonable account of what the mind really is and where the self fits in it. The self has to be the central figure of these scenarios uh, that the mind is, is uh, mind, uh, consists of. Uh, our scenarios uh, passing back through time into the future and the present, uh, m multiplying possible scenarios so we arrive at a decision that matches intention based upon those ex epigenetic rules and the cultural and uh, background and uh, personal experience. Uh, can be welded together into a reasonable naturalistic account of, of what the mind is, with the self being a necessary central actor in uh, this uh, sequence of scenarios. In fact, our intense desire, I would, I would suggest, uh, to put everything in narratives, right down to the preference of everybody in this room, including myself, when they buy a book, uh, to give a book that has a story in it, uh, the mind is a narration uh, producer, uh, is a reflection of the fundamental uh, scenario building uh, activity of the, of the mind. I don't know exactly how you feel about that, but it, uh, does that sound like a reasonable, if somewhat uh, uh, embryonic description of, of what's happening in the world of cognitive neuroscience, integrative neuroscience? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to turn now to something that I find more of a, I guess, a puzzle for both of us, where I, I get the feeling that you're more confident that we have or will soon have an answer than, than I am. And this is uh, what we might call the um, irrational thought, including many uh, uh, religious beliefs that we see in all human cultures. Just an, an example, you have a wonderful description of um, what used to be called primitive thought, but might more accurately be called the thought patterns that characterize probably humans in all societies, but most markedly pre-scientific societies. Describe it as intuitive and dogmatic, bound up with specific emotional relationships rather than physical causality, preoccupied with essences and metamorphosis, opaque to logical abstraction or arrays of the hypothetically possible, prone to use language for social interaction rather than as a conceptual tool, limited in quantification mostly to rough images of frequency and rarity, and inclined to view mind as stemming partly from the environment and able to project back out into it so that words become entities with power unto themselves. And that isn't the half of it. I mean, people in all societies have what can only be described as daffy beliefs, such as you can bribe the gods for good weather. You can divine the future from tea leaves and chicken entrails and so on. You can, uh, if your child gets sick, it's because a spell was cast on them by someone in another tribe and you should go out and risk your life attacking the tribe in revenge for the, cast, for the spell that they cast that makes your child sick. Now these are nutty beliefs. They seem to be widespread uh, I, I think it's insulting to say in primitive societies because you can certainly see evidence for them in our own. Um, if the, as both of us are, are apt to believe, the human brain is an organ that evolved to solve the kinds of problems that our ancestors faced in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, since it no doubt is maladaptive to waste even a, a moment or a morsel of food bribing gods for good weather, why is this such a, a characteristic trait of our species? Why should we be ashamed for our species? Yeah, I, a reader of uh, the, the book in manuscript uh, commented to me uh, that, uh, you know, you're not just describing the primitive mind, you're describing the average American. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, I think one uh, area where our thinking has converged. It's a, it's a nice example of consilience in, at work out at this outer edge of the natural sciences where we both are working, uh, is uh, the conception that the brain evolved uh, for survival. It did not evolve for self-understanding. That's why uh, people know less about their brains than they do about their automobiles. And the role of science, and let me stress too that Science is not 
a uh, arcane activity by an elite group of, of people. Science is the common body of accumulated and testable information possessed by all. Uh, the function of science has very much been, and uh, throughout most human activities, incre is increasingly effective uh, in uh, taking uh, these, uh, these prisms and, and filters of, of the mind and the algorithms we have that do give us adaptive value, uh, give uh, these strange ways of thinking adaptive value, and uh, showing uh, what the true correspondence is by multiple methods uh, with uh, our sensory input and our ways of logic, the correspondence to the real world. And uh, so this, uh, I think, is a, a very much a part of the, uh, the Natural Sciences Concilious, Consilience Project. I wonder how we're doing on time. I was just thinking that uh, we were thinking in terms of about a half an hour and I don't want to cut you off on this, but it might be a good idea to, uh, uh, maybe I'm preempting our uh, moderator here, but uh, of simply opening it up to uh, discussion. Uh, expatiation, rebuttal, humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> so why not? Uh, go ahead. Well, it seems that as I thought on the way down, the two of you are really very strongly in agreement on just about everything. I don't see any disagreement sign of it between you. There are people who disagree. Uh, there are dualists out there, as you know. And I think among them probably is Thomas Nagel. Uh, Nagel, as you, as you both know, said at one point, it's consciousness that makes the mind-body problem so intractable, which is why all studies of it either ignore it or get it hopelessly wrong. Now, I don't think, I don't think you've got it hopelessly wrong, but it seems to me that in the book, How the Mind Works, it is kind of ignored. It is kind of shut aside. Uh, Daniel Dennett has a book called Consciousness Explained, which does not explain it. Would either or both of you in the next two minutes or so be able to explain it to us? <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me turn that over to uh, uh, Steve, but, but let me just... <laughs> Uh, right, I, I knew I was going to be able to dump something on him, but no, I, I actually, this, this is a challenging problem, and uh, it is a worth, uh, uh, very worthwhile to, um, I, I mean, it's, it's a privilege to, to try to answer it. Let me uh, uh, say, first of all, though, uh, about that problem, uh, that uh, philosophers like Nagel, with all due respect, were writing, for the most part, before cognitive neuroscience. And now we have a very different picture. I think it's significant that philosophy appears to be dwindling, particularly philosophy of mind, with the best minds, and there are superb minds indeed out there, like Dennett and the Churchlands. Uh, they seem to be abandoning philosophy, although they won't admit it, in order to become theoretical scientists. Some of the best philosophers uh, now uh, are uh, really theoretical neuroscientists or theoretical ecologists. And uh, therefore, uh, I think uh, we see signs already that uh, the search is on and, the, and uh, that uh, hope exists even among philosophers, uh, that, uh, that that problem, which was considered intractable, can be solved. The uh, the mass of uh, literature that has been coming out uh, when put together, as I attempted to put it together, uh, like that from the Churchlands, from Steve Coslin, from uh, Daniel Dennett, from, uh, from Damasio and others. I, you know, as an outsider, I could sort of review it and try to put it to together in what I considered a consensus. And that's what I've done in Consilience. And I have no great difficulty uh, myself in, uh, in imagining how that problem of consciousness can be solved. But I went on too long. What do you say, Steve? <laughs> uh, I, the, the, um, I do discuss consciousness actually in some length in, in how the mind works. And I divide between what um, one philosopher called the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problem of consciousness. Easy is ironic in that it'll be uh, you know, a good century or more before we figure it out. But the, the easy problem is how does the information processing activity of the brain uh, give rise to conscious experience? Uh, 
how does anesthesia work, what parts of the brain light up when we see red or taste salt or feel pain or have an idea or fall in love, uh, what counterparts can we find for these activities in other animals and therefore uh, how might we reconstruct the evolution and so on. And uh, that is an active area of psychology and neuroscience and I think progress is going to increase until we have a, a complete understanding. The heart problem is why we're conscious at all. Uh, and this is Nagel's problem. What is it like to be a bat? Don't tell me what the bat responds to or how the circuitry works, but what would it be like if I were in the bat's shoes or claws or <laughs> whatever a bat has? Uh, how do I know that your red is the same as my red? Uh, did when Captain Kirk steps into the transporter room and he's reassembled on the planet, is it the same Kirk? Or did you know, one Kirk commit suicide and another come into being? <laughs> These are what are traditionally called philosophical problems. Uh, they keep you up in the dorm room when you're in college till the, the wee hours. You go around and around and they're great fun and you never seem to get any closer to a solution. The idea that I put forward, based on a suggestion from a, the philosopher uh, Colin McGinn, is that there are some truths of science that the human mind may never grasp at an intuitive level. So just as I will never really understand what came before the Big Bang, even though I'm assured that the question is meaningless and that time didn't exist before the Big Bang, or how something can be a wave and a particle at the same time, that's uh, nonetheless part of my mind can accept that as truth, while another part can never really feel it in my bones. And similarly, the idea that the information processing activity of the brain gives rise to subjective experience, to my own sentience, is an idea that the scientific part of me knows is true, because I know that if the brain no longer functions, consciousness vanishes, and if you change its electrophysiological functioning by taking drugs, you have, as they say, altered consciousness, and so on and so on. Nonetheless, why that should be true, I suspect, is uh, something that we're never going to be able to intuitively feel, even as we understand it at a mechanical level in more and more detail. Uh, Steve, uh, <clears throat> just to show that we didn't spend a month in advance making sure that we we're in 100% agreement, uh, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me suggest that you're wavering. Uh, <laughs> and that um, uh, I, I, you know, independently of you, I, I worried about this, uh, uh, this uh, the hard problem, uh, as Neil Chalmers and others have suggested it. And it didn't seem uh, to me to create much of a difficulty because I've spent a lot of my time thinking about how animals may be thinking. And uh, I think that the answer is uh, to this is that uh, you, we, we will not know uh, what they feel like, uh, what, their, you know, what their subjective impressions are, uh, but that does not matter. Uh, you know, when you could have a person who's colorblind, I remember that was the one originated by the philosopher Jackson and carried on by Neil Chalmers. A, co a, piece of, a person who's uh, colorblind uh, really can never understand what red is when we think of it. Well, so be it. Uh, if you had an ant that was uh, raised to uh, high intelligence, seeing the world of an ant as an ant sees it, we could map all the neurons of that ant brain, and we would know what it was seeing and what impressions it was having, but we would not have a subjective impression. We could never have that. Do we need uh, to have that knowledge in order to say that we fully understand the process? I think not. When people do have the same sensory capacities, most humans do, and they have a similar uh, background and vocabulary and the like, then it would be quite possible for you and me to communicate by watching, I mean theoretically in the future, communicate uh, with one another literally by watching one another's brain scans on a screen. That, was, that would be the answer. It may not be adequate, but I, let me say I'm just obviously I'm a little more reckless than you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do agree with the, with, um, yeah. with the, the major uh, assertion, namely that scientifically it makes no difference if we ever, uh, whether or not we ever solve this problem, and I suspect that we, we won't, that if we could trace the flow of information through a nervous system and predict how it would, the patterns would result in behavior, then the job of the scientist would pretty much be done, and whether it's an ant or a human, then uh, we should be, uh, we would be satisfied.
The only difference is that there are a couple of non-scientific ways of thinking that would still be deeply unsatisfied. One of them being just plain old-fashioned human curiosity. Well, what is it like to be a bat? Or what is your red like? If I could see the world uh, from your eyes, what would it look like? Or if someone offered me the opportunity to step into the transporter room, should I do it or not? Even if no one could tell the difference from the outside, I could tell the difference from the inside. And I suspect that we're never going to answer these questions, but I suspect that we will always be curious about them. But more, even more significantly, a lot of, I think a lot of moral intuitions hinge on our imperfect attempts to grapple with this problem. The starkest example being, if you had an, a robot that was wired up to behave exactly like a human, but you knew it was just a bunch of clanking gears and chips and levers and so on, would dismantling it be destruction of property or murder? Uh, this was actually played out in, a, in an old episode of Star Trek and many other science fiction <laughs> stories where, you know, should you be allowed to dismantle Lieutenant Commander Data to reverse engineer him, <laughs> or would this be snuffing out a sentient being? And the answer to the question really hinges on this unanswerable question of whether there really is someone home inside Lieutenant Commander Data who actually feel something that you would be extinguishing as you dismantled it. And so I think we are left in something of a dilemma that our moral reasoning depends at least in part on issues that as scientists we are at some point have to punt on. You left some work for the philosophers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Would you comment on my opinion of what the, uh, the concept of mine is? Uh, I feel that it's an energy uh, soul consciousness of the energy going through matter, solid matter, like n n n nerves and neurons and the gray matter, that in the, et in the essence, that uh, upon death, it will it, uh, even penetrate the, uh, the brain itself and go on to further uh, dimensions or uh, ways of thinking that consciousness, its essential nature is. Could you uh, um, I th I comment think I on that? Please. Speak for both of us. And say, um, I think I, I think I disagree. Um, I, I think that both of us uh, would say that the, the mind really comes from the neurophysiological activity of the brain, and when the brain dies, the mind is, uh, is over and done with. Uh, one kind of evidence is that despite heroic attempts at the yeah, 19th actually, century, no one... Is electrical uh, light signals throughout our brain picking up words that you had pre-recorded, and that your consciousness is a part, uh, uh, a part from your physical body. It is a light force. And you could define what light and electricity is, how it could penetrate the matter and, 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 and metals and so forth. Then you, you, you define what consciousness is. And if you avoid uh, uh, pointing out that uh, uh, discrepancy, it is a truth unto itself that you can't not just you know, avoid and, and say you know, poo it doesn't exist. It does exist. That's our essence. It does exist, but no one has been able to communicate with the dead, despite heroic efforts. And there's no ac aspect of mental activity that has not been tied to the functioning of the brain. There's nothing that you can do to the brain that doesn't change consciousness and thought and emotion. So reasonable hypothesis is that the mind is the activity of the brain described at a higher level of analysis and that without the brain, uh, the mind doesn't exist. That, that sounds like a, a grim conclusion, but I think it's, uh, I think it's an it's exhilarating it's conclusion. It's like saying and, consciousness yeah. doesn't exist, and your conscious words to me, I could say it doesn't exist because it's not making sense. Good. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for all your work. I just want to recommend a book which you might be familiar with. It's called Without Miracles by Gary Sisko, C-Z-I-K-O, and it really Chico, yeah. um, kind of uses variation and selection as the process, as the consilience, really. That's um, the thing. I also want to suggest that the reason religious thought persists um, is that it's almost like a lot of religious language is very uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty about, like, in the beginning was the word or a Zen cone. And I think it's a kind of play activity for the brain. That, that's sometimes I think that's why people enjoy it. Anyway, well, thank when you. you speak of the um, religious experience, you're actually speaking of uh, uh, an entire, uh, uh, a broad ensemble 
of intense uh, intellectual and emotional experiences. And certainly these include uh, the desire for, for mystery uh, of the unknown. We just seem to have a, a deep love of the unknown that we still can move toward and make great discoveries and bring ourselves to higher levels of fulfillment. Uh, I, I think that probably is Paleolithic. I, I, you know, it's, uh, it goes along with the evolution in the capacity of the mind and our emotions that helped make humanity so successful as it spread around the world. But another aspect uh, that uh, certainly is extremely powerful is the need for uh, communion, uh, for a feeling that you belong to something greater than yourself. This can be the tribe, it can be a great ideology that's sweeping across humanity, uh, it, can be, it can be a family, but most powerfully, uh, it uh, whole, uh, latches onto or creates as part of cultural evolution uh, the traditional religions with their cosmologies, their rites of passage, their liturgy, uh, and this gives deep emotional satisfaction because to belong to a group, uh, to be able to participate fully in it and be altruistic to other members and even be willing to some degree of self-sacrifice has enormous uh, Darwinian uh, value as pointed out actually first by Darwin in uh, The Descent of Man. Uh, the ultimate then being what we seek, combining elements of mystery and communion in uh, what is called the, uh, the mystical union of many religions considered the, the ultimate is the, is the mystical union uh, with whatever it is, the divinity, the sense of wholeness and so on. Uh, and uh, that I think we will never, uh, never give up. Indeed, uh, you are witnessing it in my expressions of uh, optimism about consilience. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so um, uh, my question is addressed to both of you, whoever wants to you know, take a shot at it. So, yeah. um, Can you speak up a little bit? I'm a bit hard yeah. of hearing. I'm sorry. Otherwise, <laughs> you're going to get this guy answering all the questions. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, our brain seems to have um, um, a fairly, fairly evolved ability to appreciate and enjoy music. And this, the music that we enjoy, um, at least apparently, doesn't seem to be correlated with stimulus that we get from the outside world, but rather um, is our, of our own creation. So, you know, we don't hear Beethoven in nature, you know, so, uh, or anything even remotely like it. Um, so, uh, how, in some sense, what survival value does um, our fairly sophisticated and evolved uh, ability to appreciate music have? I know that Steve, well, I'm not just trying to shovel this on to you because one of my own graduate students did his PhD on neurobiology of music using uh, lesions for a musica patients to figure out uh, what some of the controls of uh, music uh, uh, synthesis circuitry could be. But I know you've written on this uh, substantially, so I'd like you to answer that. Uh, it, it's an excellent question, uh, um, and it's a real uh, puzzle. I think part of the answer is that there's no reason to think that everything that people do or enjoy has survival value. That the, given a brain that has a number of mechanisms that do have survival value, there can often be new combinations uh, that in, and of, in themselves don't. So when you have a species that's equipped with the um, circuits that give it a sense of pleasure in certain environments, in uh, pleasant landscapes, uh, it, with tastes of nutritious foods, with auditory patterns that can be analyzed. You have a species that also can manipulate the environment, control, use cause and effect to build things, to bring about consequences. You put those together and you've got a species that can figure out ingenious ways of stimulating its own pleasure circuitry, of basically getting at our pleasure buttons and pressing them, even if that short-circuiting doesn't itself have survival value. A, a simple example is junk food, uh, rich desserts, which certainly don't have survival value, but given a creature that 
evolved a taste for sweet and fatty and salty food, given a creature that over the past few centuries has invented food technology, we simply concoct artificial stimuli for the sole purpose of giving ourselves pleasure, exploiting circuits that did have survival value, but not necessarily fostering our own survival now. Now, in the case of music, as you point out, it is a human creation, but it does tap circuits in the brain that must have existed for other purposes. One of the purposes is simply analyzing complex sounds into their waveforms, and there's good reason to believe that the ear and the brain do a kind of harmonic analysis and look for uh, frequency components that are in harmonic relationships, which is the alphabet of, of tonal music. We also respond to the emotional contours in one another's speech, the uh, tone of voice that expresses anger and sympathy and sarcasm and so on. We respond to uh, vocalizations that aren't part of language but that express emotion, like uh, crying, whimpering, sighing, moaning, and so on. And so a hunch is that music consists of the ability to develop technologies, basically noisemakers in the world, that excite the same circuits in the brain that originally evolved to analyze complex sounds and to respond to the emotional coloring of one another's speech and voices. Now that isn't, I'm not completely satisfied with that as an answer because it doesn't explain the nitty gritty details of tonal music, but I think it's a, uh, an entry into the problem. Let me pose just another question to you related to that. Uh, extremely important, uh, obviously. The, uh, I, I, my impression of uh, the neurobiological work uh, so far, as sparse as it is on, uh, on uh, musical, the musical capacity, uh, is that um, the uh, linguistic and the musical uh, circuitry is overlapping. As they, they hold certain circuits in common, but there are some that are unique to musical uh, capacity. Um, and uh, the uh, proposal has been made that, uh, that music, you know, even as we, we see it developed in, in present societies, um, preceded language and in fact may have facilitated the origin of, of spoken language, of linguistics. Is that, what is your view on that? My hunch is that it's the other way around, that it is clear that, that music borrows some of its circuitry from language, both at the neurophysiological level and in terms of the actual content. The fact that musical pieces are organized into phrases, that they have a rhythm that can be aligned with the rhythm of speech so that we put lyrics to music and the stresses in the words correspond to the beats in the music. The fact that uh, music seems has the feeling that it conveys a message and that there are rise and fall patterns in the pitch that evoke emotion in the same way that particular uh, forms of oratory and poetry can in speech. But if one, if one wants to think that the useful thing came first and the byproduct was a consequence of that, then it's easy to see how what the use of language was. We exchange information. Whereas for the puzzle of music is how useless and frivolous it is from the biological point of view of survival and fitness. As meaningful as, of course, it is in our everyday lives, it's, I think, a puzzle to a biologist, and that leads me to, to suspect that it's a byproduct of other things that were useful, language being one, auditory analysis being another, and motor control being a third. The fact that when we run or walk or do repetitive tasks, there's an optimal rhythm, and so the system of movement needs a, an innate sense of rhythm. Music somehow taps into that, although how it does, we, we don't really understand. It seems to have a universal uh, value, too, in binding groups together. That is, uh, as, form, as part of the, uh, uh, the rituals. But in a minute, Barbara Goldsmith discusses her biography of Victoria Woodhull, a 19th century suffragist, spiritualist, and presidential candidate. If you'd like a videotaped copy of this or any C-SPAN program, check our website. The address is www.cspan.org.